the signing of the oil agreement, the NRM has regained the strategic initiative. I now feel more or less like in December 1985, when we finally had the manpower and the weapons to capture Kampala. Oil debate here in this parliament On the 10th and 11th of October 2011, you are about to involve us in a new strategic mistake, delaying the conclusion of the oil agreements, which had been discussed by very competent people for a very long time. As a government, you can't say you have no space to continue making the mistakes. Because those mistakes are very costly. And second, we would be saying we are running as if we cannot go and run from the countries that have been running the sector for the last how many years? Decades. Over four decades, there are many countries in Africa that have been doing, have been exploiting oil. There are many countries outside Africa, like the Norwegian government that has been helping us under the oil of development program. It has all the skills. It has all the experiences we can go and learn. Here is an opportunity for the political elites in this country to be on record. That, we were, that during our time, we were able to put in place a legal regime, a policy regime, an institutional regime that was able to utilize, uh, to exploit our natural resources, to cause lasting development. The conversation around oil discovery has intensified. And it has intensified in, in, in various directions. One is that uh, oil discovery in Uganda is being seen as an area of potential conflict. Then there are the school of thoughts that see that oil discovery in Uganda is actually a blessing. Oil can be found all along the western region of Uganda and as such, there are many different communities with different ethnic backgrounds and different opinions. We are always here, people here, gossiping, gossiping from every day. We are talking about it. Have you seen the oil? Why don't you talk about the goods here, about the cabbage or whatever? You just talk about the oil. Emotional. There is no one who feels at a state I can call a hard state because of lots of issues. Look, we people you are here because of the oil we have here. People are like, what will happen? To you? There's nobody who is stable here. Why are we limited on our own land? 
why do we have to first ask for permission in our own district to visit our own oil wells? <laughs> for nearly a decade, foreign exploratory firms have been attempting to discover and map further oil deposits in western Uganda. In 2008, it became clear that Uganda was sitting on one of the largest onshore oil deposits to be found in decades. A team of five researchers from the Refugee Law Project carried out a research in Hoima District under the National Reconciliation and Transitional Justice Audit, and the preliminary findings showed that oil was a major contributing factor to most of the conflicts experienced in the region. A National Reconciliation and Transitional Justice Audit. Uh, this is funded by SIDA and the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And we do this exercise with the aim of mapping all the different conflicts that happened in the, the history of Uganda, uh, as well as recording people's um, opinions on how they think all these different conflicts that they remember and that they have lived through themselves, how they can be addressed and how justice can be done, uh, essentially to, to get people's opinion and recommendations on how sustainable peace can be built in this country. And we identified a range of conflicts that happened in the past, as well as conflicts that are happening uh, now, that are happening right now. And one of them is uh, emerging tension around the issue of oil. Uh, we already see tension between uh, uh, the two countries, Congo and Uganda. We see tension between citizens in the state and we see tension between different communities that live in areas where oil is, is found. Um, which raises the question, will oil be uh, a curse or a blessing for Uganda? And it also raises a lot of questions with regards to transitional justice and national reconciliation. And with, tr with transitional justice we mean um, efforts that a country can undertake to examine the past, to deal with the past, to come to terms with the past, to prevent conflict and violence from occurring in the, in the future. I'm not a pessimist, but it is also true that when you are endowed with these natural resources, you need to be smart in utilizing these resources. Utilizing these resources in a manner that actually, and you know they do sustainable, we use the sustainable problem, that the current generation will enjoy these resources in a manner that will not compromise the benefit of the future generations, our children and the children of our children. The group of the pessimists who actually say that Oil discovery is actually a waste of time. It is a resource given the level of corruption that go with in Uganda today. They see that oil as a resource will just completely be swindled by a group of few government uh, civil servants or, or, or politicians for that matter. Much of the promises of the oil industry has yet to be realized in Uganda. The question on many Ugandans' minds today is whether this discovery is a blessing or a curse. Commercial drilling has not yet commenced and it appears as though it will be a couple of years before Uganda will begin to benefit from its recent oil windfall. This clip tries to highlight some of the key issues and tensions surrounding the oil industry in Uganda today. The main contentious issue here is first of all there are issues of um, conflicts arising out of uh, land conflicts the area is quite vast and so people are coming in from different uh, locations and settling in the area but the whole issue that is causing all this is the fact that there is oil that is already being um, that there's oil in Hoima particularly this sub county and uh, it is also bringing other issues within the district because they claim government officials are already buying land in this place here. Chunks and chunks of land. We have to call it a curse because, one, oil exploration itself is a very big enterprise. But when they were bringing it, none of us knew, apart from seeing some big vehicle passing, <laughs> taking materials, we, which we are not understanding. So it, the, the, the oil itself, the, the government has failed to inform us about oil. True, we are being Deplaced, other people are being deplaced from their place and with some very little conversation. And now, as I talk now, they say, one time they came passing saying that they are coming to upgrade this road 50 meters wide. The whole of our state of is to be uprooted. So, me, I've managed to build my, my one block, and you are uprooting it. Conversation, you cannot even define. 
So to me, to me yeah, it's a threat. The, the opacity of the discussion, people are completely opaque about how the conversation should be on the national agenda because many of the signing of agreements have been done under table. That is according to our findings that uh, many uh, respondents actually believe that given the current initial processes, it is very clear that the outcome of, of, of oil in Uganda might also not benefit many Ugandans because already uh, given by what is going on in the media, local and international, the government of Uganda has not been very transparent in terms of uh, making initial agreements to, to manage this uh, discovery. As one of the sovereign authorities in the Albertine Rift Valley, the Ugandan government is undoubtedly the primary actor in the nation's oil industry. From licensing companies to developing national policies, the government of Uganda is the most influential and crucial actor. With this power, however, comes a level of great responsibility. It is us, the people of Uganda, and indeed the outside world, that will judge the government's performance on handling this controversial oil resource. We see in Parliament a wider discussion around the laws that should govern oil discovery, oil exploitation, oil management, and, and all that goes with it, the law is still lacking. So the legal framework for the management of the resource we call oil in Uganda is quite challenging because the processes that should have been very transparent today are not being seen as transparent because just the mere signing of agreements has been a tug of war. The parliament had to, to tussle it out with the government, with the executive, which should have not been the case. Because if this is a national resource, all citizens of Uganda are entitled to know whether they have staked in this or not. Been crying, the government crying, the people crying that we are training only job seekers, not job makers. So even here you would find I would actually expect that you know, if we are going to start training, oil training in Uganda, we even have a full-fledged act of parliament, defining the content, defining the kind of people who are going to provide the training, so that you are talking of a training that is tailored to specific needs. Right now, Makirif is training, the East African University is training, Chikumba Petram Institute is training. <coughs> what are they training about? How many... Do people do we need for oil business, for oil jobs? How many jobs are going to be created? And that's what we've been asking actually that you know the government of Uganda has decided that it wants to build a refinery instead of a pipeline to export crude. A government that is very serious would be saying now with the refinery we are going to be we will create around 10,000 jobs. Then these 10,000 jobs are in these areas people managing the refinery, people managing the marketing, people managing the pipelines from the oil wells. So you'd be knowing that actually we need 10,000 jobs. So the universities actually which are creating, which are now uh, beginning the training, you'd say Makere University concentrate on this. East African University concentrate on this. The Chikumba Petroleum Institute concentrate on this. Because there is no any single university that is going to offer everything. The oil industry is going to require a vast range of, um, of skill sets. Um, the oil and gas sector is specifically looking at, say, technical skills. In those technical skills, we're looking at different, different areas like geosciences, petrochemical engineering, you could have subsurface engineering, um, it could be civil engineering. So those are some of the technical areas. With this scheme that we have in place, the Talo Scholarship Scheme is quite broad. Um, it's looking at developing capacity um, for Ugandans, Ugandan nationals, who will get an opportunity to study particular courses um, that are going to help the sector. When President Yoweri Museveni allegedly announced Uganda's vast oil find, he declared that the profits generated from the industry would be used to develop the nation. During the same announcement, President Museveni revealed how the search for oil in Uganda began shortly after he took office, more than two decades ago. 
the government's policies towards oil, though still very much unclear, appear to center on making Uganda self-sustainable. However, the people of Hoima quoted President Yoweri Museveni Kaguta in 2011 while officiating a function in Duhanga saying that, do not talk about oil because there are many other things to talk about other than oil. The government says they should never reveal those secrets in their agreements, in their deals, in whatever, to the communities. I tell you, I understand. So we should not talk about oil. We should not even talk about oil. It's been worried. Because this thing, it is new and it is displacing our people. The environment is being affected. People are being affected. The world is why can we? How? What is the the future. Local community leaders feel as though they have largely been left out of the oil industry. Their marginalization throughout negotiations could lead to increasing hostilities towards the current government and oil company. Should, now, the first, should they say that compensation, not, not be, you are, you are to, to be out of your house from six months, above six months, then they give you 30%. When it is below six months and below, out of the total compensation, they give you 30%. Because but should it be six above, mm. they give you only 15% of the total compensation. So we try to calculate if you, somebody give you 15% of maybe five of, of, of four million, which means they will give you 500,000. Will that also or, 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 or some 300 to 400? Can that one be enough to construct a commercial house? And that was the only plot you had. That one cannot even buy one, cannot even buy a lot. Bunyoro Kingdom feels that given what is going on, they should actually have more stakes than the government of Uganda. They should actually sign a memorandum of understanding with the government of Uganda. Go to actually sub-region. There's a whole discussion around said, well, given a conflict in northern Uganda, why don't we now give and take? Oil discovery should actually offset all the post-conflict re recovery expenditure that the government would like to undertake. If the government continues to ignore the wishes of local communities, it would be reasonable to assume that tensions between the communities and the NRM government will escalate. By ignoring the desires of local communities, the government could be creating a disconnect between itself and the people, which is often associated with resistance movements in other oil-rich African states. In five years' time, Uganda could become one of Africa's largest oil producers. From an economy largely dependent on agriculture and the domestic market, Uganda's transition to one of the top 50 global oil exporters presents an exciting opportunity for the nation. By 2015, Uganda's export revenue could jump from 2 billion US dollars to 4 billion US dollars or higher. The question remains, is Uganda heading to the resource curse?